I want to start there in verse 1, where the Bible reads, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. And you know, as we go through the book of Proverbs, we're going to see a lot of things repeated. We're going to see things said over and over and over, and they say it in little different ways. And when I was reading this verse, one of the things that kind of pointed out to me was the fact that people oftentimes can see the same situation, or they can hear the same words, or they can be in the same experience and have two completely different viewpoints towards that situation. You know, they can look at, you know, maybe who's running for president and say, oh, I love that person. And another person says, oh, man, I hate that person. You know, and the Bible's saying, a wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. So now in this situation, we have two sons. Is the father being heard by both sons as far as, like, literally? I mean, when it says, but a scorner heareth not rebuke, is he saying, like, this, with the son, that's the scorner is just deaf? He, like, literally just didn't hear his father. No, that's not what the Bible's saying. He did hear his father speak. It just went one in, in one ear and out the other. He just didn't want to hear it. He didn't have anything to want to hear it. And it's interesting that the wise son, when he hears his father speak, he says that's instruction. But the scorner, the wicked son, when he hears his father say the same thing, he's like, oh man, that rebuke. Why? Because, you know, the, the wicked son's usually doing that which is wrong. He's in sin. So when his father's giving him instruction, he's like, man, that's rebuking my lifestyle. But the righteous son, the wise son, he's hearing that instruction. He's like, that's good advice. That's something I should do. So as a child, when you're listening to what your father is saying, you can choose to say, hey, I, that's good instruction. I should follow that. Or you can look at it and say, ah, oh, I don't like the fact that he's trying to correct me, that he's reproving me, that he's rebuking me. And you just turn off your ears. You just say, I don't want to hear that. And we have a lot of examples in the Bible. If y'all turn to Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7 there in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. You know, the Bible has a lot of different people who didn't really hear what Jesus was saying. And you know, there's a lot of different times where people were looking at the same situation and they thought of it differently. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, what did the Pharisees think about that? They thought that was a great victory. They were like, this is great. We finally got this heretic out. He was trying to overthrow us in the synagogues. We finally got rid of this heretic, this false teacher. What happened to the, the people that were his disciples? It was a great loss. I mean, at that time, they were, they were weeping. They were crying. They felt like they had lost their Messiah. They weren't really sure. Many of them didn't understand the fact that he was going to come back from the dead, that he was going to fulfill the scripture. So in that one circumstance, they, two people were looking at it with completely different perspectives. And after the cross, after we have the New Testament, there's still two perspectives. People look at it and say, man, that was the greatest thing ever. It saved my soul. Jesus Christ died on the cross for me so I wouldn't have to go to hell. How glorious the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. But to the heathen, it's foolishness. They look at the same event and they just, they just don't even want to hear it. They just turn off their ears. They just think it's just foolishness. They don't want to hear about the cross. But a saved person, many times they want to hear about the cross. They love it. They love the story. They love Jesus Christ. And in Luke chapter 7, we'll look at verse 36. It says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with them. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence, and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will he love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered in thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hast washed my feet with, her, with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, 
for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they sat at meat with him, began to say to themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. So we have a really important story here where Jesus Christ is coming to a house and a, a woman who's not a good woman. She didn't live a good life. She doesn't live a good life. Everybody knows it. But she comes weeping at his feet. And she's washing his feet and kissing his feet and even wiping it with, the, with her hair. She's just, she's so broken because it's the Lord Jesus Christ and she's just loving him. She just loves the Lord Jesus Christ. She loves the fact that he's going to save her from her sins. But we see the Pharisee, we see the, the disciples, they, they're saying in themselves like, what is this woman doing? And Jesus is looking at him and he gives him instruction. He says, you know what, I came in, you weren't like kissing my feet. You weren't coming anointing my head with oil. You could, I mean, you're just acting like some regular guy. This woman at least has the respect to realize that I'm the Lord Jesus Christ and she's coming to serve me. And you know, a wise son heareth the instruction of his father, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Jesus Christ was giving this guy instruction. So if he hearkened unto it, he would say, you know what, I need to start loving Christ more. But if he didn't, if he turned off his ears, all of this words would just become rebuke unto him. And he would just, oh, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear how Christ wants me to serve him and love him and do good things for him. So you can have two different perspectives with the Bible. You can look at the words of God and say, this is the greatest instruction on how to live my life. Or you can say, well, I don't really like that part. And just turn off your ears. And it's going to go in one out and out the other and they'll become a scorner. Someone that's not, you know, going to be wise. Someone that's going to have lots of problems. Somebody that nobody wants to be around. And it's interesting that you can look at two different situations and have two different outcomes. Many times Jesus Christ said they hear, or they see, uh, but or, I'm sorry, I'm not going to quote it right, but he's basically saying they can see with their eyes, but they're blinded. How can you see but be blinded? He's saying they had physical sight, but they just couldn't understand the things of God. And those that, you know, want to look at their father's instruction, they don't understand that, that the father just wants their child to succeed. Why does a father rebuke a son? Why does a father give instruction to a son? Because he loves him. Because he wants him to do better. Do you think the father's like, don't go play in the street? Because he doesn't want their kids to have fun. He's like, man, I know you'd have so much fun in the street. It'd be so great. No, he's giving that instruction so they wouldn't get hurt. Because he loves them. The same thing is with every command in the Bible. If we get that understanding, if we get that perspective that every single commandment of God is for your betterment, is for you to live the most success in your life, it'll change your life. Even the small things. Obviously, when you first get saved, there's a lot of big sins in the Bible. You're like, man, I need to get over that. But then as you continue to grow and get more mature, you're going to see God doesn't want you to just change your physical you know, appearance before men. He wants to change your thought life. He wants you to pray in secret unto Him. He wants to do your alms, you know, in private. He wants you to do fasting in private. Those are not things that a babe in Christ can do. That's not something that a babe in Christ is just going to have success at. So as you grow and you mature, you need to see the, the harder things of God and realize, hey, that's for me. That's what I need to be seeking for. I need to go to the next level. I need to hear the instruction of my Father and not just turn off my ears. Say, you know what, I don't really like that part, so I'm just going to turn off my ears to it. No, we need to hearken into all the instruction of the Father. Look at verse 2, it says, A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of transgressors shall eat violence. So we see over and over in the Bible, it just constantly says that the good, that those that sow good are going to reap good. And those that sow into wickedness, they're going to eat of their own wickedness. I thought of Matthew chapter 7. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Should just be a few uh, chapters back from Luke if you're still there. But we see a man's going to eat good by the fruit of his mouth. So it's talking about eating, and it's talking about what's coming out of your mouth. And it's interesting that the, the, the transgressors shall eat violence. I mean, what comes out of your mouth is so important. And we need to be careful about what comes out of our mouth. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 verse, six, or verse 4. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moat out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast the moat out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your feet, and turn again 
and rend you. You know, the interesting thing that I saw here is that a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth. I don't think that Christians should go around and everything that comes out of their mouth is just talking about wicked reprobates. You know, talking about all the wicked, evil people. You just go around and you can't just stop talking about, man, I just hate the sodomites. And man, I just hate pedophiles. And man, I just hate adulterers. And man, I just hate murderers. Because the Bible says a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth. Is that what you really want to eat? Because the Bible says if you're, you're just casting your pearls before swine, they're going to turn around and rend you. And the Bible says, but the soul of transgressors shall eat violence. Even a Christian can eat violence. If you just go around just rebuking people and just spewing everything that's negative from the Bible, someone's going to turn around and rend you. You're going to suffer you know, violence by the hand of your mouth. I think that a Christian should be going out and spreading the good fruit. What is that? The gospel. That the Lord Jesus Christ saved your life. The Bible says that we should be you know, uh, meek unto every man. That we should uh, speak that which is right. I mean, I think the first time you meet anybody, no matter what, it should just be good coming out of your mouth. The Bible says to reject a heretic, heretic after the second admonition. So that means the first two times you were rebuking him. Meaning, I don't think it's right to just walk up to somebody and rebuke them. You should be kind to that person. You should preach them the gospel. You should speak the truth in love. But of course, if you were to speak with a heretic, which can happen, then you should rebuke them. Of course, when you're preaching from the pulpit, you're going to preach all of God's Word. And sometimes it's going to have harsh rebuke. But you want to eat good fruit. So why don't you sow good fruit? Christians should be a light under this world. They shouldn't just go around and get their pet doctrine that they just learn and think so cool and just spread all that filth all the time. I don't even want to hear about it, really. We just, you know, the little bit that the Bible talks about it, that's about as much as I want to hear about it. I mean, the, we... We talk about it, the fact that the, you know, Sodomites are in the Bible and it's a few times, but it's not that many times. And if you look at the New Testament, it doesn't even have the word. So why don't we just focus on the things that the Bible puts the most focus on? That should be what comes out of your mouth. What's the thing that the Bible talks about more the most in the Bible? Praising the Lord, right? Praising Him for He's good. His, his mercies endure forever. Lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what should be coming out of our mouth. And you're going to suffer, you're going to have good things happen to you if you're praising God. You've got to realize that every word that comes out of your mouth, God hears. So, do you really want all the things that come out of your mouth to be negative? Or do you want a lot of them to be just praise unto Him? That's what should be coming out of our mouth. And why are the soul of the transgressors going to eat violence? Because nothing good comes out of their mouth. It's always evil, it's always wicked. Look at verse 3, it says, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. So again, just the same thing. If you, if you want to have a good life, if you want to be preserved, you need, to, you need to keep your tongue tame, as James would say. You need to not just spew everything that would come to your mind. You need to not just open wide your lips. Why? Because you're going to come unto destruction. Even a Christian can come unto destruction when he just opens his mouth and just lets whatever come out that just he just thought of. We need to be you know, wise and be careful with the words that we choose to come out of our mouth, no matter who we're talking to, because it can affect so many people. Even if you're just talking to somebody in church, you need to make sure that the words that come out of your mouth are wise, that they're right, that you're not just opening your lips and just saying whatever comes to your heart's desire. Because the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Right. It says in, uh, let's turn to Psalms chapter 38. Psalms chapter 38. In Proverbs chapter 10, I'll read for you. It says, In the multitude of words there wanted not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Do you want to be someone who's wise? Refrain your lips. That means this. If you never realize that you're, you're stopping yourself from speaking, you're not wise. So if you say, man, I don't remember a time when I wanted to say something and I just held my tongue, it's because you're not wise. A wise man will often hold his tongue, will often refuse from saying something. And you know, I struggle with this sometimes. As a kid, I always wanted to talk. I wanted to just share everything that was on my heart. I just wanted to be the person that was constantly talking. But you know, as I started to mature and get a little bit older, and sometimes I would stop myself from saying it, I would play it back in my head and I'd be like, man, I'm so glad I didn't say that. You would think about, man, that was a good thing to not say. I'm really glad I held my tongue in that moment. And that will happen. But if you're always uttering what comes to your mouth, you're not wise, according to the Bible. Look at Psalms 38, verse 11. 
My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sword, and my kinsmen, kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. But I, as a deaf man, heard not, and I was a dumb man that opened not his mouth. Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me when my foot slippeth. They magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. So when David was this great man, this great man, the king of Israel, we see that his enemies are just, they're just waiting. They just want to hear him say something wrong. They just want to hear him say something perverted. They just want to catch him in that one lie. So that they, when his foot slippeth, as the Bible says, they can magnify themselves against me. And you know, there's so many people that hate Bayboard Baptist Church, that hate Pastor Anderson, that hate Roger Jimenez, that hate the pastors of this world, and they're just waiting. They just can't wait for that foot to slip, and they're just going to pounce all over it. Just think if one of those men actually slipped into a grievous sin. I mean, the news would be all over it. They would just hound him. Just think of how many people's faith would be destroyed because of a great man of God that falls. It's so important. If you want to be a great leader, if you want to be a great man of God, get your mouth under control. Why? Because you need to think about the words that come out of your mouth because you can be trapped by them. Because your foot could slip. And I was thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ when He stood before Herod. What did He do? He never opened His mouth. And now the thing, interesting thing about Herod is we know that earlier, John the Baptist had rebuked Herod for the sin that was in his life. And what did Herod want to do? He wanted to kill him. But he feared the people, so he didn't. Now when Jesus Christ was standing before Herod, if Jesus had opened his mouth to rebuke him, do you think Herod would have been like, well, I don't want to kill him? No, of course, he would have wanted to kill Jesus Christ. But would he have feared the people in that situation? I mean, were the people wanting Jesus Christ to live? No. And if Jesus Christ had been killed by the hand of Herod, by maybe being taken out in stone, or beheaded like, like John the Baptist, would he have been the Savior of the world? No. 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 Nope. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ stood as a deaf man. And this is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. He opened not his mouth to preserve his life in that situation. He preserved his life so that he could fulfill the Scriptures. So that he could, you know, go on and die for the sins of the world. And the Bible says, you know, don't cast your pearls before swine. Let him that is unjust be unjust still. Jesus Christ already knew that John the Baptist rebuked him, and he didn't want to hear it. He'd already turned off his ears to rebuke. So what was the point of Jesus Christ going on and just railing on him more? There wasn't a point. And we as Christians need to understand that, look, we should preach the whole Bible. We should, we should stand firm on the truth. But if you're going to talk to the unsaved, give them the gospel. And if they're not going to hear the Bible, don't just sit there and rail on their sin. It's not going to preserve your life. And it's not the wise thing to do. Let's look at verse 4. It says, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. So if you want something, you've got to do something. If you just lay around, what happens? Just think, has there ever been a day in your life where you're just lazy? Where you just kind of just sat around, didn't really do much, maybe... You know, you just looked on your phone or listened to something or watched something. You're just kind of lazy. What, what tends to happen when you're really lazy? You just start thinking. You start thinking, man, it would be cool if I lived in this really big house. Or, man, it wouldn't be so cool if I had this really cool car. Or, wouldn't it be cool if I could travel across the world? Or, wouldn't it be cool if I could have this, have that? I mean, when you just start lazy, you have all this time to think. And many times, you'll be caught up in the desires of, the, of this world. You'll be caught up in the riches of this world. You'll be caught up in the things you don't have because you're not busy, because you're not doing and working hard. And the guy that's just this sluggard, this just lazy person who just lays around all day, man, he desires all kinds of stuff. I mean, if you were to go to his house and be like, hey, what do you want? Oh, where do I start? You know, I want to win the lottery, and I want a big mansion, and I want to buy a Ferrari, and I want to travel the world. I mean, he's got all kinds of desires. But you know, the man that works really hard that works really hard for his money and understands the importance of doing a good job and working hard, he many times doesn't have you know, room in his heart for all these vain desires. He's just like, you know what, I understand how much money it is for to buy a $100,000 car. 
I mean, that's a lot of work. He's like, I really don't even desire that. Because I wouldn't want to waste my good, hurt, earned, hard money on something so foolish and vain. Amen. Right? Amen. But you know, when you just lay around and you're just lazy, you're going to have all kinds of desires. But guess what? You have nothing. You're not going to get anything laying around. It says, but the soul of the diligent man, or the diligent, shall be made fat. When you do work hard, when you're a diligent man, you're going to have all the things that your heart desires. God's going to bless you. Amen. And you might not have that super fancy mansion or the, that, that Ferrari, but you realize the vanity of it all. And you're going to have the things that are going to make your soul fat. You're going to have the things that you desire. You're going to have you know, a good house, a good, a good car, a good job. The man that goes out and works hard has the things that he needs. He can provide for his family. Amen. It says in verse 5, A righteous man hateth lying. But a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. A righteous man hates lying. As, as Christians, we should hate all lying. We should always hate anything that has to do with lying. We should never involve ourselves with anything to do with lying. But a wicked man, you know, the, the interesting thing about this, he's even loathsome. And the word loathsome there is meaning like, you know, not desirable or or people don't really want to be around him, or they just don't look at him in good, a good light. The interesting thing is, even this world hates lying. I mean, when you look at the politicians, what's like the number one thing that they try to attack their opponent with? Oh, he's just a big liar. Oh, she's just a big liar. Even this world recognizes the fact that lying is wicked. That lying is evil. And how much more as a Christian, as a, represent, or a re representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, should you hate lying? Should you not do that which is wrong and go out and be a liar just like the rest of them? Because you're going to be loathed even more than the wicked guy. As being a Christian, they're going to think you're a hypocrite and you're going to be loathsome. And the Bible says you'll come to shame. Anytime you lie, you will always come to shame. It will never be a good thing for you. Look at verse 6. It says, The righteous keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. No one likes wicked people. The Bible says righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. You're going to be caught up in your sin, and nobody wants to be around that. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. The Bible makes it very clear that the righteous are going to be held up by God, are going to be preserved by God. God's going to be a shield unto them. But the wicked, He's just going to overthrow them. He's going to destroy them. They're going to come to destruction and poverty and shame. Everything wicked. And it might take a while. It might not happen immediately. But when you get that in your heart, it helps you realize, I want to be righteous. Because I want those things. People don't think that. They think, oh man, if I live a wicked life and I lie and I cheat and I steal, I can get all the way to the top. But God's going to overthrow the sinner. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29, the Bible says, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. So the Bible says that righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. Now the interesting thing about righteousness and upright is God made you to be upright. But how are you going to stay upright? By being righteous. By doing the Bible, what the Bible says. Everybody starts out being made to want to be upright. But the only way you're going to stay on that course or go towards that way is by being righteous. What is righteous? Doing the right thing. How do you do the right thing? By hearkening unto his instruction. But wickedness will overthrow the sinner. Why does the person that's upright get overthrown? Because they get caught up in sin. Because they don't desire to do the right thing. Look at verse 7. It says, There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. So back in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 7, it's talking about someone who's rich, yet has nothing. Or that makes himself poor, but hath great riches. So turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. So I think this is another great example, like we saw in the beginning, where you can look at a situation, and one person can think one thought. But from another perspective, you can see how it's completely the opposite. The Bible's talking to a man that has great riches, yet has nothing. How is that possible? Look in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. It says, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, 
and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So in this, in this passage, we see a guy or a church or a group of people, they're like, I'm so rich! But when Jesus Christ looks at them, He says, no, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. So it's the same guy, and he has physical riches, but he's poor. Why? Because he doesn't have riches towards God. Because he's not doing anything for God. I've been in a church where they didn't have any soul in it. But this was a fancy building. This was an independent, fundamental, King James only, Baptist church. <clears throat> it was a beautiful building. They had 500 plus people coming to the church. They had all kinds of uh, Sunday school course programs. They had all kinds of kids programs. They had a huge choir. They had people playing instruments. And I remember the pastor got up and he's like, oh man, we're so blessed. We're, we got so many riches. We're doing so great. And somebody stood up and they were like, what about Revelation chapter 3 when they say they're rich and they have all these goods, but God says they're poor, blind, and naked. And he was on to something. Because they didn't have any riches towards God. Because they weren't going out and preaching the gospel. Because they weren't getting anybody saved. They had an altar call every single service. And guess who walked down? No one. No one ever walked down. In God's eyes, that church is poor, blind, and naked. And you know, the Bible says in Revelation before that, when it's talking about the church at Ephesus, it says because they lost their first love, He was going to remove their candlestick from them. He was going to remove the light, the gospel. When you don't preach the gospel, you're going to lose the gospel, and you're going to be poor, blind, and naked. How are you going to be blind? Because He took away the light. Because you're not preaching the gospel. Because you're not going out and getting people saved. And the Christian who has lots of money, lots of friends, and seems to live in a fancy house and have a good job, but doesn't ever do anything for God, is poor, blind, and naked. If you want to have riches towards God, you got to serve God. you got to do what He said. There is that making themselves rich, yet hath nothing. If you're even as a Christian, just like, you know what? I just want to work for that 401k. I just want to work for that retirement. I can't wait to just go to the country club and you know travel and do all those things. You're going to have nothing. You're going to go to heaven and the Bible says you're going to suffer loss because all your works are just going to be burned up in the fire. Look what he said there in verse 18 of Revelation. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. God wants you to get gold, but He wants you to get that heavenly gold that comes from going out and getting somebody saved. By going out and preaching the gospel and getting that, that righteousness that comes from uh, winning somebody to Christ. When, the, when the, it's tried by fire, it's going to stand. That soul is going to stand. And He's going to be in heaven with you. And you're going to have great riches in heaven. But you're not going to get that by chasing the riches of this world. That's why it says, "There's that make of himself poor, yet hath great riches. The man that decides to just give up all the vain things of this life. There's, you know, think about John the Baptist. Did he have any riches? No, but I bet he had a lot of riches in heaven. That's somebody that made himself poor, but decided to have great riches in heaven. Because he desired that which was in heaven. Go back to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13. We'll look there, verse 8. The ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor here is not rebuke. The interesting thing I thought about this verse, basically saying if you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. When you're poor, when you don't have anything, I mean, you, you can just go out and you can just preach the gospel. You can just do whatever you want. And even if you're not saved, I mean, the poor heareth not rebuke. I mean, have you ever walked up to some guy that's just a homeless guy? I mean, you're like, you know, you're not doing that which is right. It's like, who cares? Like, he's he not going to be instructed by anything you say. But you know, the rich man, he's tied to his riches. If you have anything to say that has to do with his riches, I mean, he's just trapped by that. That's his ransom. You know, and a lot of times you think about in movies, uh, they would uh, have a rich man and they would kidnap one of his kids and they would have a ransom because they wanted to get all of his money. And sometimes you see the rich man has an like, internal struggle. He's like, do I want my kid? Or do I want to give him $50 million? And it's just a sad reality that riches can take the heart of a man to where even if it was your child, you'd be like, oh, I don't know. 
I mean, take all my money. I just want my children. And obviously, yeah. you know, many of the points of those are the fact that you can't just trust a terrorist and you can't just give them money. But if it was a real situation where they had to choose, like, press a button for $50 million for their child, there's a lot of wicked people that would choose that money. Why? Because it's the ransom of his life. I mean, that's all he's living for. He's just living for paper, for just junk, for just garbage, things that are going to be destroyed in this world. It's just vanity. It says in verse 9, going back to Proverbs chapter 13, it says, The light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Now, as I was going through Proverbs chapter 13, I felt like this verse really encapsulated the entire chapter the best. The light of the righteous rejoiceth. When you have the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can have true joy Amen. in your life. And as we go through Proverbs, you're going to see the same things over and over. You're going to see, you know, hearken unto instruction. Speak that which is right. You know, the good are going to be preserved. And I think you can look at it from a lot of different perspectives. One perspective is the fact that you can rejoice because you have the light of righteousness. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. What is your driving force in life? What is the thing that makes you want to wake up every day? What is the thing that just turns you on and gets you excited? Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So we see Jesus Christ, He's saying unto the disciples, Ye are the light of this world. But we saw in the rest of that verse that said, The lamp of the wicked shall be put out. So what is your driving force? You know, what is the thing that you're shining forth to other men? Jesus wants you to shine your good, your good works. But what is it that all the heathen shine before men? What is it that the, the heathen get all excited about? Going to like football games? Going to the basketball game? Going to concerts? Going, you know, to all these sporting events? And when their team scores a touchdown, they're like, Yeah! Woo! We scored a touchdown! Yeah! I mean, they get up and they scream and they yell. And I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of them, and they're screaming, and they're yelling. But the Bible says the light of the righteous rejoices. We should be the ones rejoicing. We should be the ones that have something to yell about. Praise the Lord for His salvation, for His goodness. His mercy endureth forever. Think about going to heaven. I mean, men get up and scream and dance about a guy scoring a touchdown. And we can't get excited. We can't rejoice about the Lord Jesus Christ conquering death and hell and giving us eternal life, making us the sons of God, sealing us with the Holy Spirit, giving us everything we could ever desire, giving us His entire Word. Jesus Christ is with you day and night if you just read His book. We can't get excited about God. Shine your light before men that they can see your good works. We should be lights unto the world. You know, and unfortunately, a lot of people get excited about coming to Faith Word Baptist because they learn about a lot of false doctrine. But then they're just this like false doctrine light. They just want to go around and preach against sodomy and filth and wickedness. God wants you to rejoice about the good things. Amen. I think we should be understanding of the Bible. We should understand all the doctrines. We should preach against wickedness. But God says He wants you to shine forth your good works. Amen. Is it a good work to believe that a reprobate is going to hell? That's not a good work. Go out and preach the gospel. Go out and preach the truth that the Lord Jesus Christ can change your life. He can, he can do everything for you. He's done everything for you. We should shine our lights so bright that people are just looking. Man, look at Faith Forward Baptist Church. Everybody that goes to that church is so excited. They're rejoicing for the Lord. They're lifting up their voice. When they sing the hymns, they sing it with heart. They sing it with rejoicing. When they go out and they preach the gospel, they're excited. They love the Lord. Come see my zeal for the Lord is what the Bible says. We should be excited. We should be able to be more excited than those people that go to the sporting events. Yeah. That go to the concerts and scream and yell. We should get excited about soul winning. When someone comes in here and says, I got somebody saved. We should be like, Amen! Hallelujah! 
When someone comes to church, when someone's memorizing the Bible, when someone preaches a good sermon, that's when we should be rejoicing. That's when we should get excited. Amen. What's your driving force? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. We should be rejoicing in the Bible. How many people didn't have the whole Bible? Why don't you just rejoice about the fact that you can get all of God's Word today? That you could read all of it? How exciting! How exciting to live in a time where you can go out and you can preach the Gospels your heart's full. I mean, is there anything stopping you from preaching the Gospel at any hour of the day? I mean, go out and preach the Gospel whoever you want. Why don't you rejoice in the truth? It says in 2 Corinthians 1, As ye have, all, as ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye are ours, as the day of the Lord Jesus. Who's your rejoicing? When someone gets into church. When you just you get so excited. You get somebody saved, and they get in church, and they change their life, and they become a soul winner. That's exciting. Yep. That's what I want to live for. That's good. You know, I want to start a church one day, and I want to have people come to my church that want to learn the Bible, that want to be faithful soul winners. The greatest thing for me would to have a Timothy. To have somebody that I could train in the Lord, that I could train to go soul winning, that I could train to learn to read the Bible, to be a pastor. That's what I would desire. I don't want to go start a church and just have a bunch of lukewarm people in my church. Amen. I want people that want to rejoice in the Lord. That's good. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible says in Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. The Bible says rejoice so many times in the Bible, and we ought to rejoice that God is our Lord, that God is our Savior, that God has saved us, that God has given us everything that we could desire. In James chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. All that rejoicing in the football game is evil. All that rejoicing in the concert is evil. All that rejoicing in vain things and men is evil, according to the Bible. The only thing we should be rejoicing in is the Lord Jesus Christ. But even God's people sometimes neglect rejoicing in the Lord. So there's just nobody rejoicing in God. And he's looking at all this rejoicing in the earth. There's so many people that are so excited about all the vain things of this world. And God's like, so evil. I mean, I gave you life, I gave you this earth, I gave you the Bible, and nobody wants to rejoice in me. I mean, just think how that hurts God's heart when he has nobody that wants to rejoice in him. But then when he sees a group of people that are rejoicing in him, he's just going to want to shower his blessings on them. He's just going to want to protect them. He's going to want to preserve them, just as a father wants to preserve his child. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth. But God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. When we get to heaven, we're going to be rejoicing. We're going to be rejoicing with all the people that planted and we watered. Or the people that we planted and they watered. And we're in heaven and we got people that got saved. And we have gold that's been tried by the fire. That's the thing to rejoice for. And we should rejoice in this earth. Why don't you think about the things that you should be rejoicing for? The things that you can be. Because all such rejoicing of men is evil, according to James chapter 4. You know, you'd say, what do you think about all these sporting events and all these, these things? Evil. Go to uh, Proverbs chapter 13, back to Proverbs chapter 13. So I think in the context of Proverbs 13, you can make the application of rejoicing to all these. You could, you could kind of take it in that light. We look in verse 10, it says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Now this is kind of a, a more famous verse. You know, one of the, you could probably apply it to a lot of different situations. But I was thinking about marriage. You know, and it could even apply to just relationships. But only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. So turn to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25. We're going to look at one verse there. In verse 24, the Bible says, It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman and in a wide house. So we see the only way you're going to have a contention is by pride. And we see someone who is contentious 
is pride, prideful. And the Bible's saying here that someone that a brawling woman, you're gonna, you know, it's just terrible to live with this person. Now, this could be applied to men or women, but it's applied to women in this in this context. And it's saying that this brawling woman's contentious. So why is it that she's, you know, having contentions? Because she's filled with pride. You know why there's contentions in marriage? Pride. You know why there's contentions in relationships? Pride. And the Bible says they're not well advised. Turn to James chapter 4. You say, what does it mean not to be well advised? Well, when you get all the Bible, when you understand all the commandments of God, when you get your heart right, you're not going to be lifted up with pride. The Bible says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. When you get your heart right on the Lord Jesus Christ, when you realize all the sins in your life, when you realize the ways that you can affect, you know, better yourself, you're not lifted up with much pride. And you realize the whole point of a marriage is to serve the other one, is to serve the other person. So if you're always wanting to serve the other person, you realize all of your faults, you're not going to have much pride. You're not going to, you're going to be much more humble. And when you're humble, there's not going to be any fights. If you see a relationship where there's just this constant contention, there's just this constant fighting, it's because there's pride there. And how does the pride get there? Because they're not well advised. The person who's not well advised is not reading this book. They're not following the words of God. And therefore, they get lifted up with pride. They think about themselves in a selfish way. They think, oh, I'm so great. I'm so wonderful. Why isn't my spouse just doing what I say? Why isn't my spouse just hearkening unto me? Why isn't my spouse doing great things for me? Me! Me! And they get lifted up with pride. And then there's that contention. But when the person is just focused on the other person, when the person is just focused on what the Bible says about what a marriage should be like and being a servant, you're going to have much less contention. Now, I'm not you know, so foolish to say that in a marriage you're not going to have any contention. I mean, that's just silly. Any two people that are married together and live together, you're going to butt heads at times. But if you want to really reduce your contentions, if you really want to have a great marriage, if you don't want to have brawlings and contention, read this book. Be well advised. Get the Bible in your heart so you won't be lifted up with pride. In James chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war. Yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask not and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever there will be a friend of the world is an enmity of God. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he that giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So it's interesting, he starts out by saying, why is there fightings among you? Do they not come from your lusts? And then he finishes it by saying, God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. If you're fighting with somebody, if you have contention with somebody, there's pride there. So if you don't want to have the fightings, if you don't want to have the contentions, you need to get rid of the pride. How can you get rid of the pride? By reading this book, by getting a humbling view of yourself. God says over and over, you know, forgive your brethren. Forgive those because I forgave you. And none of us can ever forgive somebody as much as Jesus forgave us. So why don't you just get rid of all the pride in your heart? You know, there's a lot of times where I fought with my wife, and I was thinking, you know what? All the things that I'm mad at my spouse for are just foolish. They're just silly. They're so meaningless. And the only reason I'm hanging on to it is because I'm just lifted up with pride. Because I just don't want to let it go. I just don't want to forgive her. I don't want to just be a servant under her. And that can happen to any relationship. When you're just harboring on to foolish, silly things, you're going to have, you know, and you're lifted up with that pride, you're going to have contentions. But with the well-advised, when you get more of this Bible on your heart, when you have a bigger perspective of this world and what's going to happen, you just want to get past it. You want to be more humble. Let's go to verse 11. It says, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathered by labor shall increase. So over and over we get the same things. Easy come, easy go. If you just get wealth by vanity, it's just going to go away. But if you gather slowly over time, it's going to increase. Look at verse 12. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. That's another pretty famous verse. 
Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. You know, the interesting thing I think about this verse is if you're ever going to promise somebody something, you know, I, in many businesses I work for, it's true as the day is long, under promise and over deliver. Under promise and over deliver. If you ever tell somebody, hey, I'll have it to you in two days, and two weeks later come by, that person's going to be really angry with you. That person's going to be like, man, you told me it was going to be two days. What's going on? What's happening? But if you tell somebody, hey, you know what? It might take me a couple weeks. And then you show up two days later, they're going to be excited. They're going to be like, whoa, that was awesome. And you know, in any parts of your relationship, maybe your marriage, maybe your friendship, maybe the church, maybe anybody, make sure to under-promise and over-deliver. It says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. When you understand the fact that when somebody's excited about something, when somebody's expecting something, and it gets delayed, it can hurt. You know, I was thinking about an example that I'm really glad I didn't have to go through. is Brother Garrett. Brother Garrett had, had planned to go to South Africa, I'm sorry, Botswana, and to get married, and it got delayed. I bet that just made his heart sick. I bet it makes it really sick when you're so excited about your marriage, you're so excited to get married, you're right there, it's just a couple days away, and then it's just delayed. It's just going to make your heart so sick. It's just going to make it, you know, just a rottenness. And it says, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Hope is such a great thing. You know, when that hope comes and you can get so excited, it's just a tree of life. And when you can get back on the right track, you can just get back and just be so excited, it's just a tree of life. We should make sure and be cognizant of the fact that hope deferred maketh the heart sick. It's just an awful feeling when you have a great expectation and it's delayed. When you have a great expectation and it changes. When you have a great expectation and you're let down. That's why I try to really make sure that if I ever promise to do anything for somebody, I think really hard before that promise changes. Really hard before I'm going to be delayed on that promise. And if you want to have success in your job... Never promise your boss something that you can't deliver. It's going to make his heart sick. He's going to be like, man, I really thought this guy was a great employee, but every time he tells me he's going to do something, it never happens on time. It's just going to make his heart sick. Be cognizant of the fact that when you, when you just don't deliver, you're going to make people upset. You're going to hurt their heart. Now, obviously, your boss probably doesn't just like have great love in his heart for you or whatever, but he's going to be upset. Look at verse 13 in Proverbs chapter 13. Whosoever, or so, whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Turn to Job uh, chapter 28. Job chapter 28. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. Ultimately, if you reject the Word of God, you'll go to hell. Because only by the Word can you get saved. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And he, that, uh, <clears throat> he that despiseth the Word shall be destroyed. But he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. We should hearken unto the words. It can't say it over and over and over again enough. We need to hearken unto the words of God. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. You want, to, you want to avoid bad situations? Get in this book. Good understanding giveth favor. We talked about favor of the Lord a couple chapters ago. You want to have favor of the Lord? Have good understanding of this book. And do what He said. Do what God said. In Job chapter 28, verse 28, it says, And unto man He said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. You say, Oh, I have great understanding. Well, are you still just... Chasing after sin? You're just chasing after that was evil? You don't have any understanding. Understanding is when you take the knowledge that you have and you apply it to your life. You say, you know what? I know what the Bible says. That's knowledge. But understanding is when you actually do it. When you actually depart from the evil. When you fully make full circle and you say, hey, God wants me to not lie. I should not lie. And then when you don't lie, that's understanding. How much, you know, think about it this way. If you had a young child and you told them, hey, don't touch the stove, it's hot. And they run over there and they just stick their hand on the stove and they burn like, ah! Did they understand what you said? You're like, no, you didn't have any understanding. I told you not to touch it because it was hot. But if you understand, you oh, I'm not going to do that. And not doing it is the understanding. When you, when you have understanding, it's because you're following God's commandments. The person that never goes out soul winning, 
doesn't understand soul winning. That's why somebody that doesn't go soul winning should never critique anybody that doesn't go soul winning. Or, or, sorry, I probably said that backwards. Somebody that doesn't go soul winning should never critique somebody that does go soul winning. Because they have no understanding of soul winning. None. You can't understand something if you didn't do it. And this can apply to any part of your life. I don't think, you know, I, I kind of struggle with this, but a lot of people say, don't give me parenting instruction when you don't have kids. And I always be like, oh, I, I know what it's like to have kids. I think it's true. Don't give parenting advice if you don't have kids. Don't give marriage advice if you haven't been married. Don't tell a plumber how to do plumbing if you never did plumbing. Because you have no understanding if you're not doing it. Don't give anybody instruction in the Bible if you're not doing it. Because you have no understanding. That's why the Bible's talking about removing the beam out of your own eye. So you can move the remote, the remote out of your brother's. If you have this sin in your life, if you can't even succeed yourself, you don't understand how to do it. Don't tell me how to do it. Show me how to do it. Amen. That's understanding. Amen. Fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Why do people depart from evil? Because of the fear of the Lord. Because of the Bible. Look at verse 16, Proverbs chapter 13. Every prudent man deals with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. Don't expose all of your circumstances. Don't expose everything that you have, that you know. Let him that is unjust be unjust still. Look at verse 17. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador's health. Verse 18. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Bad things will happen to you when you refuse the instruction of God. Look at verse 19. The, instruct, the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is abomination to fools to depart from evil. Turn to 1 Peter for chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. It said there at the, at the end of that verse, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. You know, the wicked people, they don't want to give up sin. They don't want to give up fornication. They don't want to give up drinking. They don't want to give up all their reveling. They think it's an abomination. You're talking to people that are unsaved, and you say, you know, I go to church three times a week. I'm not going to, you know, lie with other people. I'm not going to lie and steal and chill or kill. I'm not going to do all the, the, uh, the evil of this world. They're like, that sounds awful. I want to do all those things. I want to listen to all the ungodly music. I want to, you know, just commit all this fornication and adultery and do all these things. They're like, you're just silly. Why would you want to give that up? Look at verse Peter, or chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he hath suffered in the flesh, hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For in the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. When you do that which is right, when you go to church three times a week, when you go out soul winning, when you give up all the sin in your life, they're going to speak evil of you. They're going to say bad things about you. They're going to say, oh, this guy doesn't like to have fun. Oh, this guy is so judgmental because he doesn't want to do all the same things I'm doing. We under, need to understand that we have to have fear of the Lord and not fear of man. Go back to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He that walketh with the wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Evil pursueth sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. If you want to have you know, good things in this life, walk with wise men, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. I don't want to be around these wicked people that are going to constantly be, you know, speaking evil of me because I don't want to do all their wicked sin. So I should walk with wise people. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, I'll just read it for you, it says in verse 30, And why stand ye in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts in Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. 
The Bible's saying, look, you can't be deceived by the fact that if you surround yourself with wicked people, you're not going to be affected. Even the most righteous person is going to be affected by evil communications. So awake to righteousness and sin not. Do that which is right and rejoice in the Lord. He speaks it to your shame when nobody has the knowledge of God. Go back to Proverbs chapter 13. If you're there. Verse 22, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So just as much as we shouldn't chase you know, riches of this world, that we shouldn't desire to be rich, it's still a wise thing to leave an inheritance to your children, even to your children's children. And you know, there was, a, there was a man that was given a great inheritance from his father. That was Solomon. Solomon was laid up a great inheritance from David. David had prepared many goods for Solomon so that he could build the house of the Lord. He stored all kinds of lumber and gold and silver. I mean, he did a lot of preparation to give his son an inheritance. Turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. Ecclesiastes 7 says, Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. So I think that it's, it's a good thing to leave your children some kind of financial inheritance. You know, to give them, you know, not leave them with some debt, or leave them with some kind of burden, but leaving them with some type of inheritance, maybe a house, or maybe some goods. You know, nothing, something modest. You know, you should have your house paid off, and not have some debt to lay on the burden of your children. But, is inheritance always restricted to financial things? No, it could be also that you give them a good inheritance of righteousness. That you give them a good inheritance of wisdom. What if David had given Solomon all the riches that he did, but no wisdom? It would have been destroyed. That's why in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21, it says, An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. There's a lot of people, you know, when I worked in my, my first jobs, I saw a lot of businesses. And there was a lot of businesses where the dad worked really hard, and he built up a great business, but he never let his son work hard. He never taught his son wisdom. And then the son came in and just destroyed the business and just ruined all the inheritance. It's more important that you teach your children to have wisdom so whatever kind of financial inheritance or whatever goods you can give them, they can be wise with. Amen. They can use for good. Amen. It's more important to give them the wisdom of the Lord, to give them that kind of inheritance, to give them the inheritance that they can have wisdom. But of course, I do believe that it's not, uh, it is right to still give them some kind of financial blessings or some kind of you know, prosperity that you can pass on. Not to be desires to be rich or to lay up treasures on this earth, but if you give them some kind of inheritance, which we see a lot of godly men did, they gave good inheritances to their children. We see that the children of Israel are supposed to pass on the lands and the goods of, the, of their fathers unto the children, to every generation. And the generations are supposed to have goods. I mean, it's good to pass on something to your children. That's a blessing. I hope that, you know, I can give my children some kind of blessing. But more important than money, I want them to be wise. I want them to have that kind of inheritance. Because if I give them money or not, if they have wisdom, then they can, they can get money. They can, they can be wise. They can get a job. They can provide for their family. Exactly. It says in Proverbs uh, 13, going back, verse 23, Much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that destroyed for want of judgment. You know, the interesting thing about this verse is there's a lot of people in America that you would say go hungry. You know, there's a lot of programs at schools that do like this snack pack for kids where they give kids like Pop-Tarts or they give them all kinds of stuff to take home because they don't get three meals a day. Because they don't get food every on the, on the table. And children should be, you know, blessed by their parents. They should understand, I love my parents because they give me food every meal. There's a lot of kids that don't get meals every day. But is it the fact that we don't have enough food in America that people are going hungry? It says that there's much food in the tillage of the poor. Meaning the poor go out and they work really hard and there's all these goods produced. There's so much riches in this world. But it says there's destroyed for want of judgment. Why is it that all these people are going without? It's because of wicked government. It's because there's no judgment. It says in Psalms chapter uh, 72, He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. Psalms 72 verse 4, He shall judge the poor of the people, he shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Why is it that there's poor people? Because of the oppressor. Why is it that the poor don't have food? Because the oppressor's not getting judged. Yeah. If the wicked people in our government were judged, we wouldn't have all this communist 
garbage happening in this country and the poor could have food. Because there's much, there's much food in the tillage of the poor. The poor can go out and make a lot of food. But guess what? They're held without because there's no judgment. The wicked people are allowed to oppress people. They're allowed to exact all kinds of debt and usury and all kinds of wicked sins on the poor so that they're without. So they don't have any goods. They can have all kinds of wicked laws. They can pump all kinds of filth on the TV and on you know the radio and tell all kinds of lies. So people are just constantly consumed with alcohol and all kinds of wicked fornication and adultery. And all this sin has a toll on people. And people don't have any food. They want that judgment. Because with judgment would come righteousness into our country. And it would give food unto the poor. But you see the reason that people don't have food? There's so much money in this world that every person can get fed. All the people in Africa that are starving could be fed. All the people in all these countries... But when you look at a country that doesn't have much food, that has a lot of poor, do you think that's a righteous government? A government with a lot of judgment? No. With a righteous government, when there is judgment, when wicked doers are punished, when there's not just all these handouts and all this government you know, spending, you're going to have much food for every person. Go back to verse 24. It says, He that spared his rod hated his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Uh, I think of Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. You can flip there. It's like a couple chapters over. It says in verse 13, Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy le lips speak right things. Now, I was kind of talking about how you could take the word rejoice and you could apply it to all these verses. A lot of times you'd read this, it says like, He that spared the rod hated the son, but he that loved them chasing them at times. You say, how does that have to do with rejoicing? How does that have to do with rejoicing with the Lord? But look at verse 15 there in Proverbs chapter 23 we're seeing. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice. Now, why is it that a father should chasten his son? Because he wants him to do that which is right. Because he wants him to be wise. And when your son's wise, when he's doing that which is right, you're rejoicing. You're rejoicing in him. God wants to be able to rejoice in you, and he wants you to be able to rejoice back in him, so he's going to chasten and scourge you when you sin. Just as a father would chasten and scourge his child, they're going to love him back for it. They're going to be wise. They're going to be able to have that great rejoicing says his heart's going to rejoice when he sees his son doing that which is right. Why is a father spank his child? Why is he beat him with the rod? So that he'll be wise. So that he can have rejoicing in his son. So that he can see his son live a great life. Let's go to the last verse, verse 25. It says, The righteous eateth to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. So the righteous is going to eat to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. You want to know your, your soul to be satisfied? Be righteous. Do that which is right. You know, praise the Lord. Rejoice to the Lord. You know, I think every single uh, chapter, or every single verse in here could be related to rejoicing. You know, we can't focus on every verse entirely. But I, I got a lot of verses I want to just read to you before we finished. The word rejoicing is found in the Bible so many times. And all of you turn to uh, one of them. Turn to uh, John chapter 5. John chapter 5, we'll close there. It says in Psalms 21, 1, The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. You want to have a satisfying soul? Rejoice in the salvation of the Lord. You want to have your soul to be filled? Rejoice in the salvation. The Old Testament talks a lot about salvation too, and rejoicing because of it. Psalms chapter 32, 11, Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice ye righteous, and shout for joy. All ye that are upright in heart. You know when you're upright in your heart, when you're doing that which is right, you can just shout for joy. You can praise the Lord. When you're living in sin, oftentimes it's harder for you to rejoice in the Lord. True. Psalms 33, verse 21, For our heart shall rejoice in Him, because we have trusted in His holy name. Even in the Old Testament, I mean, just making salvation so clear. And you can just rejoice in Him, because you trust in His name. Yes, Psalm 35, And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in His salvation. We haven't even gotten to the New Testament. 
New Testament, Matthew chapter 2. When they saw the, sto the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When the wise men saw the star that was going to lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ, they rejoiced greatly. They were like, it's the Lord. We can go find Him. We should rejoice greatly that we can find the Lord. It says in Matthew 5, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. When you're persecuted for the Lord, you can rejoice. You can rejoice because of His salvation. You can rejoice when you're doing that which is right. You can rejoice when you're being persecuted. Luke chapter 1 says, And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at His birth. I love Christmas when you can celebrate the fact that you can rejoice in the birth of our Savior. I'm not going to celebrate some fat man that gives presents. I'm going to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ that died for my sins. I'm going to rejoice in Him, in His birth. Amen. I love singing the Christmas hymns. Amen. You know, I don't want to hear about Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. I want to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ and His birth. Amen. And I don't care whether or not it was December 25th or not. It says in Luke 1, it also says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary rejoiced in her Savior. Acts chapter 8, And when they were coming out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch was rejoicing, and God say, Amen! Romans 5, But whom we have access by faith in this grace, wherein we stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Romans chapter 12. Be, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor referring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. So we look at John chapter 5, the last place we'll look. It says, He sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and shining light. And you were willing for a season to rejoice in His light. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given to me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Why were they rejoicing? They were rejoicing in the light of John the Baptist. They were seeing His good works. They were able to see that He was a shining light for the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were rejoicing in it. We should see a man of God that wants to be a shining light in this world, and we should be rejoicing in him. You know what? I rejoice in Pastor Anderson. I rejoice in Brother Roger Jimenez. I rejoice in Pastor Burgeons. I rejoice in Brother Richard Miller. I rejoice in, you know, uh, Brother Manly Perry and Brother Donnie Romero. And any man that wants to shine the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's who we should be rejoicing in. Not in some football player. Not in some basketball player. All that rejoicing is evil. We should be rejoicing in the men of God that want to serve the Lord. Amen. Just as Paul said, you know, come follow me as I follow Christ. We should be looking to those men and we should be rejoicing in their light. They looked at John the Baptist and they were so excited. They are like, look at this man. He's coming to prepare the way of the Lord. We should be excited for the men of God. We should be excited to get behind men of God that want to preach the gospel. Amen. We should rally behind the men of God and we should just rejoice. Rejoice for the Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice when we're getting people saved and rejoice to be in a good church that loves the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this great church. Thank you for your Son that died on the cross and gave us all salvation. We can't rejoice enough for your unspeakable gift and for your love and for the hope that we have that one day we'll be in heaven and we'll be the sons of God. I just thank you for everyone in this room. I pray that we would just be able to be focused on being a shining light that we'd be able to rejoice and we'd be able to shine our light forth that men could see our good works and they could rejoice with us in our good works that lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.